On this edition of Independent Sources, Latino, the influence and argument this term inspires. And we see that particularly um, when we're looking at media images of, of Latinos, sometimes we see them all portrayed in one particular way when really those groups are very different. And how some inspired French bakers are rethinking a beloved pastry. It took me a while to understand what was it because it's uh, kind of unusual to do like kind of donut or fried stuff for uh, as a French guy. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, where we're bringing news from the city's ethnic and community media. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. Politicians and polls often approach an ethnic group as a monolithic community. But ask individuals about their ethnic identity, and you'll find that these communities are as varied as country of origin and cultural traditions. One case in point is a broad usage of the term Latino, which some argue leaves little understanding of the nuances and differences in cultural identity. So what's in the name? I spoke with professors Jillian Baez and Vanessa Perez about the origin of the Latino title and how it helps but can also hurt. Dr. Perez, why has this monolithic title emerged? And when did it emerge? Latino, Hispanic, whatever title you want. So when did we um, start with this down this road? There is actually a very long history to this term, Latino or Hispano. We can, we can trace it back to late 19th century, early 20th century, the Puerto Rican, Cuban um, population that was in New York was already using this term. We found it in newspapers. If you look at old Spanish language newspapers from that time period, they were using this term to refer to themselves as a community, a group of people who were interested in each other's cultures, learning more about Argentine cinema, um, the concerns of Cubans, Puerto Ricans. So it does have a long history, although I think that the way that it's used today mm -hmm. is quite different from what um, those groups of people were, the way that they were using the term mm -hmm. in the early 20th century. So the term Hispanic Latino came about really in the 1980s. So we first had the movement politics of the Puerto Rican movement, the Chicano movement, and the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement. After that, there were, um, the U.S. government added the term, category. the category Hispanic to the census. And that, I think, is sort of the beginning of this push towards a, a unified identity. What that did, in part, was erase these two political groups that were um, movements that were thriving in the 70s. But then it has transformed. I think Latinos have, in politics particularly, have taken on that identity. Dr. Baez, um, is it a good thing for Latinos now? I mean, I've, they've been able to capitalize on this grouping. Well, I think that we can see it in both positive and negative ways. I think certainly the biggest critique of this label Latino, right? And we have to remember too, like when we're talking about Latino, we're really talking about a pan-ethnicity, right? So an umbrella term that encompasses a number of ethnicities, right? That could be Mexican, Puerto Rican, Ecuadorian, um, and many other ethnicities. Um, and unfortunately, I think that one of the negatives about this particular term is that, or the dangers of it, right? Is that it can lump together a number of different groups. Right, and so of course, you know, um, there are things that they share, perhaps things like language or coming from similar regions, um, but culturally there are differences and that's one of the things that unfortunately can happen. Um, and we see that particularly um, when we're looking at media images of, of Latinos, sometimes we see them all portrayed in one particular way when really those groups are very different. Um, in terms of a positive, I mean, it has allowed, and I think that, you know, Dr. Perez has, has already talked about this a bit, has allowed for coalitions to form mm -hmm. um, between groups, right? So we had talked about New York, also Chicago has a history of that with Puerto Ricans and Mexicans mm -hmm. forming political coalitions. And, you know, I would say, too, the other thing that's happening is I think this means different things for different generations, right? Older generations tend to still identify, for example, from uh, their nationality. So they will say, you know, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm Mexican, I'm Colombian. 
Um, when you talk to younger generations, they usually take on both of those. So sometimes they'll say they're Latino, depending on the context. Mm -hmm. And then other times they will say they're Puerto Rican. Um, I think it especially has meaning for those of us who may be from a number of different ethnicities. So for example, let's say you're, you know, your mother's Puerto Rican, your father's Salvadoran. Um, many of those <laughs> young children, research is, is, is showing that they actually really adopt the Latino identity because it's shorthand as opposed uh, to having to explain the double ethnicity. Dr. Perez, you are uh, Puerto Rican and, and Cuban, right? Yes. And so how do you identify yourself? I, I think that what um, Dr. Baez has said is, is very true. I think it really depends on the context and who's asking the question. For the most part, I do identify as Puerto Rican, um, and that is because I lived in Puerto Rico for 10 years. So I grew up there, I graduated from high school there, I identify with that culture in a different way than I identify with Cuban culture, although I identify with it significantly, in a significant way as well, because I grew up in a home where Cuban culture was an important part of my upbringing. Does any of you ever identify yourself as Latino? And under what context do you do so? I would do so, um, I think, professionally. I am a professor of Latino studies, so that is part <laughs> of my identity. <laughs> right? I mean, but it is a, it's a significant part of my identity. I, wouldn't, I, I specialize in, um, certainly specialize in Caribbean Latinos, but there are times where I, f I do speak on national Latino issues um, when I'm identifying myself as a polit in, in a political sense. Um, I can identify with, uh, with Latino um, initiatives and political initiatives. Same question, Dr. Baez? Sure, I mean, I identify um, as Latino mostly within the outside sphere. So within professional spheres, you're right, politically, especially um, if I'm trying to build coalitions with other Latino groups, I'm Puerto Rican with, you know, um, perhaps Mexican-Americans, Dominicans, um, I will say this though, within the home, <laughs> right, in terms of I'm thinking of family gatherings and things like that, it is very rare for us to call ourselves Latino. Everyone really refers to them as Puerto Rican or Boricua and that's, um, yeah. <laughs> now, there are some cynics who would say this is sort of like a, a way to whitewash, to, to downplay the, uh, the culture and just by lumping them all together and just like, you know, instead of calling people Mexican, whatever, oh, they're all Latino. And I mean, how do you respond to that? I think that, that, that there are two ways to look at that. I think it depends a lot, again, on who is deploying the term, who's using it. So when we think about um, the mainstream media and the way that they use the term Latino, I would say that, that in many instances it seems to be true that Latinos are whitewashed in the mainstream media. Um, politically, I think there are different reasons for using the term Latino among Latinos. We want to think of ourselves, especially elected Latino officials, want to be able to rely on a Latino voting bloc um, and mobilize a Latino voting bloc on a national level. And so in that sense, the term has the potential to be very useful. Is the Latino bloc enough to get a Latino elected citywide? I think this is a difficult question partly because it depends on where we're talking about. And I only say that because I think that one of the issues with Latino politics in New York City is that the demographics of the city's Latino population are changing so much, right? Historically, yeah, it's been Puerto Ricans, but Puerto Ricans have been moving out to Florida, to Texas, other states. Um, there are more and more Dominicans. There's a, a large Mexican. Mexican population. Central um, Americans. And these are very new relationships. They're not the early relationships that Dr. Perez was talking about when this term was being formulated, right? Um, so I think that that's one of the challenges, is that these groups have to figure out what those coalitions are going to look like. Um, I de think there's definitely tensions within those communities, partly because there are differences, and I think within larger mainstream media and politics, those differences are not addressed. Um, and these communities also have very different needs, right? Um, for example, um, you know, D Dominicans have a very high temporary unemployment rate. Puerto Ricans are not as concerned with that. Um, but there are a number of educational issues there. Um, Mexicans have other, you know, issues too in terms of having younger children, worrying about the educational and housing situations. So I think that that's, that's where the conversation sort of needs to begin mm -hmm. at the level of, you know, what are our similarities and what are our differences? Well, let's, let's start at that. I mean, that uh, for us. I would think actually that it's important to build coalitions within the Latino community more so than outside. I mean, I think we need to build coalitions with outside groups as well, but I think 
I think one of the challenges with the term politically is that it has taken on almost an assumed identity, as if the term Latino Monolithic already, girl. exactly, already means certain things. Um, and I think that it's possible to come around and build those coalitions among Latinos, but that's something that has to be actively done. And perhaps one way to do that is to start by focusing on policies that different groups of Latinos can come together around instead of focusing on cultural similarities or those kinds of things. But Tobias, you study the media, and I, I presume that you, you, you have a special keen eye on how uh, Latino is, is portrayed. Do you think that the media uh, views it correctly, or is it totally off the way they describe and they identify the Latinos in the media? Well, I think that certainly, like, if we look historically at, you know, media representations of Latinos, they have been problematic in a number of ways. Um, I think, you know, as it relates to our conversation today, I think, you know, one of the biggest issues is that they're undifferentiated images, mm -hmm. meaning that oftentimes um, we don't know their ethnicity, <laughs> but yet they're portrayed in very similar ways. Um, so I think that that's one of, one of the major issues. And definitely, you know, it's ironic because we could say that since the 1990s, we've seen Latinos more visible in both uh, in entertainment media and, and a little bit less so in terms of news media. Mm -hmm. um, but these images, they're, very, they're still very problematic in terms of they're all the same kinds of images. So for example, we see Latin lovers over and over again. We see the Latina <laughs> Spitfire, right, which we can think about in terms of like Sofia Vergara, I'm thinking of like mm -hmm. in Modern Family is the, the latest rendition of that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's these same kinds of images that we're sort of seeing recycled. Um, over and over again. Um, and, and, you know, my sense is from my research, I do a lot of work on audiences, is that non Latino audiences don't know what is Mexican versus what is Puerto Rican. I think within Latino communities, we can recognize those things or try to tease them out. Um, but I think that that's one of the problems with those representations is that the outside sees this monolithic Latino identity without any kind of differentiation. Okay. Well, Dr. Baez, Dr. Perez, thanks for joining us. Great conversation. Thank Hope you. Hope you guys could come back. Thank you Thank for you. having us. Still to come on the show, a filmmaker explores salsa and sexuality on a shoestring budget. Before that, Abby Ishola has some other news. Thanks, Gary. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. From the Hunts Point Press, plans to protect Hunts Point from natural disasters are underway. The Department of Housing and Urban Development is funding 10 projects to protect several neighborhoods in the tri-state area, including Hunts Point in the Bronx and other areas along the coastline that are vulnerable to such calamities. Experts say protecting Hunts Point is particularly important since it's currently the nation's largest food distribution area. Flooding there could lead to problems with the country's food system. Planners will create levees to protect the area. Can neighborhoods like Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights preserve their African-American legacy? Stephen Witt of Our Time Press explored this question in a recent article. Witt spoke to several residents in these areas who gave their opinion on the matter. Some say the solution is black gentrification by middle to upper class income African Americans to counter white gentrification, which is taking place now. Tremaine Wright, attorney and owner of Common Ground Coffee Shop in Bed-Stuy, says longtime homeowners in the area should consider other ways to make real estate work for them rather than selling their properties. Orthodox leaders may be going after members of their community who use a popular app. In 2012, Orthodox leaders launched a campaign against the use of Facebook, YouTube, and the internet. Now the Forward reports that WhatsApp may be next. Many Orthodox Jews are using the popular messaging software for forums and group messaging with others within the community. But Orthodox leaders still consider the internet and other technology to be dangerous. John Rudolph of Feet in Two Worlds explored the practice of skin bleaching among Haitians, African Americans, and others from the Caribbean. Rudolph found that among Haitians, lighter skinned people who are often referred to as stush or uptown are looked at as upper class and successful. Feet in Two Worlds explains that in the Caribbean, lighter skinned people tend to hold political power, while in the United States, white people are more revered in the media. And finally, Sheep's Head Bites profiled a woman who continues to practice the old art of stained glass making. 
Sarah Herbst, a third generation stained glass maker at All American Art Glass, started out as a child helping her father with their family's stained glass making business. Though the art is slowly dying, she sees her work everywhere from bars to synagogues. Her family has been creating and restoring glass since the Great Depression. Those were just a few headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. Independent Sources will be back right after this. Thanks for staying tuned. Sex, Love, and Salsa is an independent film produced by Colombian-American filmmaker Adrian Manzano. The film is an often funny, sometimes sad look at relationships in the city through the eyes of a Playboy Salsa dancer. I spoke with Manzano about the project and his experience producing and promoting the film on a tiny budget. Adrian, uh, welcome to Independent Sources. Before we get into a conversation, let's uh, watch a trailer of the film. Okay. Look, you're dancing all wrong. You're going to tell me how to dance salsa? Oh, uh, yeah. Where'd you learn how to dance? My mommy taught me. Oh, that's cute. I want to perform like what you described. You want to perform? Yes. Salsa? Yes. Enjoy your time now with the girls that you bring because it's not going to be forever. There will come a time when one woman may choke you into a life. <laughs> we have a really good connection. I'm really comfortable with you. I'd like to have a baby with my best friend. WTF, we've been dating for like two months. And where I'm from, that's serious. That's like boyfriend, girlfriend serious. I'm making like a little documentary about my about my dating life. Excuse me, you're gonna do Red X movies with this camera in my house? Excuse me? Very funny. <laughs> so you. why this movie? Why did you want to do this movie? Uh, you know, you, you get to a point in your life, I was about to turn 30 and I started questioning, had some existential angst and I uh, realized I never made a film. And that's what I studied and it's, it's always been a dream and passion of mine. So I, I wrote this story about a, <clears throat> a salsa dancing womanizer somewhat based on my life, but not really. <laughs> um, and I just sort of made the story, showed it to a producer, and who was my girlfriend at the time, and she liked it, and got the actors, and a lot of the actors are a lot of local Broadway and off-Broadway Latino actors, and they love the story, too, because it's, it's a drama, they get to act, you know, they get to show, you know, their skills, and, and we shot it for a year, mm -hmm. and then two years of post-production, and finally came out and it, it did well. I understand that uh, your budget was like $7,000. How do you make a film for $7,000? <laughs> you spend a lot of time. Uh, when you don't have money, you have to spend time. And uh, we, like I said, a lot of the actors worked for free. Uh, a lot of the, the crew worked for free because they just believed in the story. And uh, you know, I was an editor for many years, so I did a lot of the post-production myself. And uh, we actually outsourced some of the special effects stuff to like Eastern Europe and to India. Because now with the internet, you can do that very easily. So Speaking of the mm -hmm. internet, uh, also, you've used that to self-distribute. Uh, yeah. And how does that work? Well, now with uh, social media, it's actually quite easy to sort of find an audience, find a niche. And because of the title, Sex, Love, and Salsa, salsa dancers, Latin dancers, anyone who's interested in Latin music finds the movie quite easily through Facebook and through Twitter. And luckily, the word of mouth has been spreading really well for this film. Mm -hmm. uh, are you getting it, uh, cinema uh, filming, uh, viewing? How is that coming? Is this something that, do you even care about that? Well, actually, yeah, we've, we've booked a few theaters. And uh, it's always nice, because you like seeing it in, in a big theater. Uh, but it's hard, because I'm, I'm not, I don't have a distributor, so I'm doing it pretty much all by myself. I'm now working with a publicist who's helping me book theaters. And we recently had a screening in Texas, because my lead actress is from Texas. And now we have talks of taking it through the Midwest, LA, uh, and even here in New York, we have a few uh, film festivals set up as well. Let's let's get back to sort of like that part of it because it's fascinating the, the opportunities that artists of all stripes have now with, with the internet, with social media. Uh, could you have done something like that, let's say, five years ago? Absolutely not. Uh, I think we've we're reaching a point now where the artist now has to really take charge of their own career and sort of build their audience. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to sort of follow the Woody Allen or Tyler Perry model where you sort of cultivate a niche audience 
that we will stick with you from film to film through the years. And now with social media, with Twitter, it's, it's possible and quite easy to do mm -hmm. that. And you're your first audience. Uh, what do you think is your natural target? I found out that Latin women like the movie a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so now my next film is it's an all Latin women cast. Um, but yeah, definitely second generation Latinos, you know, I, I would say college educated Latinos who want to see character driven stories, definitely skew more towards women than men. But uh, even from there, I've, I've seen a lot of uh, African American women and even Asian Americans embrace the film and sort of embrace sort of the style of filmmaking. Why mm -hmm. salsa? I sort of like your backdrop. Uh, it's, uh, if it wasn't for salsa, I wouldn't be born. My parents met dancing salsa in the 70s in New York. So it, it's just always been part of my culture and part of my upbringing. And um, when it came to writing the story, it was just something. I didn't, I love the music. I love salsa music. It's yeah, it is. It is really fun. It's very intricate. <laughs> you know, it's, it has a lot of parts. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Also, you know, it seems that there, there's a growing uh, trend of independent Latino filmmakers. Yeah. Is that helping or is that crowding the market? How, how do you see that? No, it's, it's, I don't think it's crowding. I think it's great because it's like all ships. What is that saying? One ship rises all ships. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you're right. I mean, we've seen uh, Rashad and Esther Green come out with Gun Hill Road and uh, <coughs> say, uh, Extractions Not Included over in, in California. So there's definitely sort of like a big movement going on with Latino filmmakers and, and the audience is luckily supporting it. So we just need to continue that and, and like I said, I'm focusing more, I guess, on a character-driven New York-based stories with a, for a Caribbean Latino market. But uh, it's, it's great because we all support each other, we're all friends. And when, when you kind of uh, look at this film, uh, it's, it, it's real funny, was that important? For you to have it to be light and and, and, and funny, like yeah. I like the 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 young lady who says, "Well, you've been dating for two months. You know, that's an eternity. You gotta give me that ring. You know, like yeah. <laughs> put a ring on it." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, comedy just comes out naturally. This, I would say my, this film this film is kind of like a dramedy. It's mm -hmm. drama mixed with comedy, but uh, I just have a natural sense of humor that comes through my writing. And in my next film, I'm sort of making it a black comedy, a little bit more like a tragic comedy. And that's kind of what I enjoy because that's what I think life is about. Life is comedy and it's also tragic. It's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of your next film, I mean, do you think you'll get away with <laughs> the same budget? I mean, people yeah. who work for free uh, the, the first time around, uh, you think they'll be willing to work for free this time? Yeah, I actually shot this weekend and the whole shoot cost me $100. And it was only one scene in, in the film. But uh, yeah, I think it's a sustainable model. Th not every film you want to shoot that way. But I think for a, a beginning filmmaker to make your films for less than 10 grand is smart because it's, it's sort of less pressure. You don't have to worry about inv getting investors and all that stuff. And, and you can sort of experiment and play. And, and that's kind of what I feel like I'm doing with this film and in my next film. I'm sort of testing out my voice, trying to figure out what my style is. And uh, to do that for less than 10 grand is, is, is low risk and high reward. Now, where can we see this film if we want to? Well, here in New York, we're going to be having a screening at the end of March or beginning of April. We're so there's two film festivals that are interested in the film. We're trying to figure it out. Um, we have DVDs for sale on the website, sexlovesalsa.com. And we should be having it on iTunes fairly soon. All right. Well, thank you very much, Adrian Manzano. Thank Thanks you for, for joining us. Pleasure. When we come back, the growing French influence on one particular pastry. Finally from us, the Cronuts arrival in limited availability has launched a local donut craze in New York. The donut croissant combo has spawned the crumb nut and the crago, you guessed it, that's a croissant bagel fusion. It's also inspired the French donut. Sarah Pizon tells us more about the French version and the growing market for more dynamic donuts. It's 5.30 a.m. and it's time to make the donuts. But you won't find these at Dunkin' Donuts. They're made with a special croissant dough that is fried in hot oil at a specific and secret temperature. After just a few minutes, they're rolled in sugar, filled with apple compote, raspberry jam, or chocolate. Then they're glazed and carefully sent off in an unmarked van. 
And the French donuts arrive here in the heart of Greenwich Village at Millefeuille Bakery Cafe. For $5 a piece, people come here to get a taste of this hot commodity. They are French donuts, or a pastry chef's Olivier Dessin's version of the Krona, a half croissant, half donut pastry developed by Dominique Ancel less than a year ago. Since its debut in May 2013, this French-American hybrid has ignited a donut sensation throughout New York City. It's been likened to the spike in cupcake popularity that happened in mid-2011. That drove Olivier Dessin to take on the challenge of creating this unusual doughy yet flaky pastry. It took me a while to understand what was it because it's uh, kind of unusual to do like kind of donut or fried stuff for uh, as a French guy. It took us a while to make sure that the product was not feeling like oily. Thank you. Wow. Mm. Yeah. You like it? I really like it. Yeah. It was his passion for making and creating new pastries that made him immigrate to New York City less than three years ago. His croissant was named Best of New York in 2012, and his success helped fuel his creativity. Personally, moving here with wife, kids, knowing, not knowing New York, not knowing anything today for education for kids. It was hard for the businesses to what you get your stuff, how it works, what the customer they will like, and everything was new. So it was hard to, to, uh, to learn a little bit of everything every day. But the people, they were keeping going, telling us, OK, that's really amazing. Please keep going. He kept going all the way to creating what New Yorkers call the best copy of the Krona. Unlike its competition, he offers his American clients more volume and different daily flavor options. Yeah, the French donut, that was the name we choose. So obviously, it's the best in, uh, in this category. <laughs> we are actually the only one in New York doing the organic uh, French flour dough with almond-free butter. While the French pastry chefs are competing to achieve a trendy hybrid donut, Mark Israel, the owner of the donut plant, is staying far from the fray. He's been running that family-owned business for more than 20 years. A lot of people are doing things with donuts that haven't been done before. So I'm aware of that, but I try to stay away from hype. Over the last two decades, Israel has created over 30 unique flavors of donuts, including glazes like creme brulee, red walnut, peanut butter and jam, and passion fruit. A donut plant was kind of alone in this field, you know, of reinterpreting a donut. You know, it was just like a, you know, it's like a wide open, you know, canvas for me, you know, just to put, you know, all my ideas onto this donut. You know, so I was just going crazy, you know, taking every fruit and every nut I could think of and making a new glaze. Israel began making his donuts from his Jewish grandfather's secret vegetarian recipe in the basement of his Lower East Side building. He's been innovating hundreds of donuts, like the square and cake donuts, and delivering them to New York's diverse immigrant community since the 1990s. Are they asking for something in particular? More. <laughs> That's led to Israel building locations in Japan and Korea. Evidence, he says, of the donut's international appeal. I mean, they've been around for a long time. You know, I don't think there are always going to be donuts. There's always going to be donuts, and you know, who knows what the donuts will look like, you know, 100 years from now. You know? <laughs> for Independent Sources, I'm Sarah Pizon. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Join us again next time. Till then. Be independent-minded.